Okay, I think we'll uh, get started with our session. I want to thank everyone for coming out today and being a part of this session. Bench top to tabletop, accelerating research impact beyond the laboratory and publications. So uh, my name is Bryant Moore. I'm Director of Strategic Partnerships at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I uh, work in our Office of Technology Commercialization and I've had a career of about 30 years in the medical device industry before coming back to the university. So it's a pleasure seeing all of you here. Um, we're gonna take a few minutes to uh, let our, the rest of our panelists introduce themselves. And then we're going to get into the, uh, the questions. And I think that this session here, especially when we look at the overall theme of the conference, uh, you know, journeying towards 2030, uh, is appropriate, but also when we, if you heard uh, Mark Post's presentation this morning in the plenary session, when he said, you know, over, looking over the next uh, seven years is not long enough. This is a long-term journey, 20, 30 years. So all of you who are here, I understand a lot of folks here are in the academic arena. Uh, you've got some great futures in front of you. So I just want to leave it with, with that. So I'm going to stop there and ask one of the panelists to introduce themselves briefly, and then we will get into the, the questions. Thank you. So, Bob. Right. <clears throat> Thank you. I don't know. Yeah, you can hear me. Um, good afternoon. My name is Bob Cunningham. I'm the uh, Senior Director of Strategic Engagement at the Wyss Institute at Harvard in Boston. Uh, the Wyss Institute was founded 14 years ago uh, as the first translational institute in the Harvard system, and our goal was to do a better job of getting technologies out of Harvard laboratories and into the market. And uh, I'll be describing a little bit of our process and how we do that. Uh, I don't have an academic background per se. I spent most of my life in the medical device industry and was a serial entrepreneur. So uh, I learned a lot of the lessons that I now try to pass on to the, the people at, uh, at Harvard who are looking to either start companies themselves or go into industry with existing companies. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Petra Hanga. Um, I, uh, well, I wear multiple hats, <laughs> so hopefully I can share some of my experience um, uh, from with both hats on. Um, so I am an associate professor at University College London, um, where I do research in the cultivated meat space, particularly in the manufacturing of cells for um, industrial production. So I look at everything um, that you can do to grow cells to uh, large yields, large scale, high yields. Um, I also look at the cost and what sort of strategies you can employ to bring those costs down. Um, and my other hat is, um, and this is uh, a bit more recent since 2021, um, I am the co-founder and the chief scientific officer of a cultivated meat um, startup that is also based in the UK in Birmingham, um, Quest Meat. And Quest Meat very much, um, well, focuses very much on developing ingredients for the industry. Um, so it looks at things like cell lines, it looks at uh, media development, uh, microcarrier replacement that is fit for this purpose. Um, and one, one thing that I didn't say is that GFI has played a very, very big role um, in me getting into the cultivated meat space and doing research. So I am um, one of the GFI grantees actually from the first round in 2019. Um, and that is what pretty much has opened a lot of um, doors um, for me in the cultivated meat space. Good afternoon, my name is David Liebler. I'm the head of scouting at the Kitchen Hub. The Kitchen Hub is an incubator and fund. It was founded in 2015 one of the world's first food tech incubators. Uh, we currently have over 26 portfolio companies and we really specialize in venture creation, meaning taking academic research, bringing in a team and funding it and launching successful food tech companies that makes up around 40% of our portfolio. Hi, my name is Alejandro Marangoni. I'm a professor and Canada Research Chair in uh, Food Material Science at uh, the University of Guelph, just uh, west of Toronto. And uh, I've been uh, in the business for 32 years. And um, besides doing a lot of fundamental work in the area of lipids and fats and oils, uh, I would say that my expertise is in general food material science, including all materials, 
Um, I, started, I started as a lipid biophysicist, and I've always had to, to try to balance this thing about fundamental work, publications, and engagement with industry, which is a very complicated thing. And I have my own opinions about it. I'm not a serial entrepreneur, but I'm a serial IP entrepreneur with uh, having put out more than 45 patents, and most of them are based on things that have their way to the market, not through me, but through others and some through me. So yeah, very complex area we're discussing right now. How do you get credit for, for the work that you do? And I think it's gonna be a really interesting conversation. My name is Yadu Dar. Can you, can you hear me? My name is Yadu Dar. I am responsible for global business development for plant-based proteins for a company named Ingredion Incorporated. Uh, I don't know how many of you know Ingredion as a company. That's great. A couple of hands in the room. Uh, Ingredion is um, one of the larger food ingredient manufacturers and suppliers. We're an ingredient solutions provider. Uh, listed on the New York Stock Exchange, INGR is our ticker symbol if you want to look us up. Um, about $8 billion in revenue last year, hopefully exceeding that this year, about 12,000 employees globally. We are on all the major continents, maybe not Antarctica yet. Um, my role in Ingredion, so Ingredion makes three major types of uh, products, texturizing ingredients, which are starches, hydrocolloids, other such ingredients, sugar reduction ingredients, things like stevia, other ingredients that can essentially uh, work like sugar in a lot of uh, products. Uh, or reduce sugar if you want to do that. And then obviously our newest line of products, which is plant-based proteins, which is what I do global business development for. I am a chemical engineer, a bachelor's and PhD by training. I have done a lot of benchtop research in my life. I have a few patents to my name. And most of my life, I've commercialized technology from the benchtop, some of it to the tabletop. So I have a lot of experience on both sides of the world in terms of how to essentially try and make technology successful. So very interesting topic today. Hopefully, we can have a good conversation. Yeah, so thanks, everyone. So the way we're going to do the, the panel today, we have a couple of focus questions for everyone, and then we have some specific questions to spread around amongst the panel members, primarily for based on their expertise, but also just because of time, because we want to leave some time at the end for you to ask uh, questions for additional input. So uh, this, this is for everyone. So uh, could you give maybe some of your thoughts on why this whole topic of tech transfer is important for the, the industry, specifically this industry. So uh, we can just, uh, maybe to do this a different way, Yadu, would you go first and then we'll come this way uh, this time to Bob. Sure, I mean, I can, I can give some initial thoughts to start the conversation. So technology is very important for all of us because uh, people come up with new ideas uh, everybody's probably seen the age-old technology funnel, right? I mean, lots of things enter the funnel. They're tested. A lot of things fail. Uh, one of the questions that have been asked initially is, what percentage of new ideas actually make it through to final commercial success? Any any guesses from the audience? Anybody? What? One. Somebody said one. Anybody else? Ten? Half a percent? So, I mean, actually, the answer is I've done a lot of work looking at this. Nobody actually knows the real answer. <laughs> it's very industry specific. I mean, that's the real reason. Every industry is different. And I think all your answers are probably correct based on your history and background. But the answer is probably much less than 10%. Could be half a percent, could be 1%. It's also what is success? Is success initial commercialization? is success 10 years of revenue because every industry defines success differently. So, but for commercialization, revenue or money from an industrial perspective is absolutely critical. So to me, I think one of the critical definitions from an industrial perspective is the definition of success for new ideas is absolutely key. And what I find is when people are trying to commercialize, there is usually a lack of alignment on what success means. I just want to open the discussion with that. How do you define success? How does the team align behind success? And then establishing that right in the beginning is key, absolutely key to success. I don't know if anybody else has any comments to add to that. 
Oh, that's a loaded comment. I would like to offer a um, complimentary, maybe complimentary. Yeah. So as we not forget where we came from, I think there is no purpose to science and technology. Science and technology is beautiful. And whatever you choose to study, it's the beauty in itself is sufficient for me. Now, um, if you don't think that science is beautiful and you're passionate about the beauty of science, then you're never going to develop the fundamental expertise. You need to be an expert because that comes from a devotion that goes beyond an application or beyond how much money you're getting. It's your artistic and scientific like choice. But having said that, you can put together a lot of people and there's those people that like to see their technology applied. And I think that you should draw from the people that have learned how to be experts and, 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 and understand the, the workings of nature in order to get to a commercial product. So I, I, don't, I don't particularly see uh, there, there needs to be a purpose to science, but I mean, sometimes people are successful in putting together scientists in order to create a product. So a straight percentage is difficult because there are many, many people out there that don't really see the application as a success. So I think that, and the university people in promotion and tenure, obviously, many times, most of the times, don't look at your like hamburger portfolio. They look at your list of nature papers. I mean, that's an exaggeration, but it's a magazine anyways. Um, so, but, but I mean, so, so it's, it's, a, it's a complex issue, but I think it has to come back to you as, as, uh, as maybe you be in love with the beauty of science. Yeah. Um... Being here at the GFC, I think it's important to really understand what's what's our main goal here. And and for me, the main goal is to create and enable technology to provide sufficient protein, sustainable, new protein, alternative protein, whatever you want to coin it, to feed 8 billion people. Okay, that's a big challenge. Good luck, guys. So I believe that and, and many like me believe that the te technology will come from the academia. It's a hotbed, it's a seedbed for novelty and innovation. But the odds are against us. Nine out of 10 startups will die. 50% of them will die in the first two years. So it's really important to refine the need, the, the, the technology, uh, the, the market fit the, the exact technology fit and work from there to really embark on this journey as well equipped as you could possibly be. And that's kind of where the kitchen steps in. We work with researchers as early as possible. Really, we will engage at such an early stage where we try to provide value and accurate different kinds of research. Um, so I, I think for me, tech transfer is important because um, ultimately the, you know, the, the, the user of those technologies will be the public. Um, so if you can translate your research and your science, which obviously is, is very exciting if you're a scientist like me um, and you do it because you love um, to something that could potentially be beneficial for people, address some of those global challenges that we are struggling with now, you know, regardless of what that is, healthcare, disease, or food, because we are at a food conference, um, and we know there, there are all these issues with food security now, climate change, animal welfare. So to me, being able to translate that research that you do in the lab into something that could potentially um, feed 10 billion people or help towards achieving that and creating food that is sustainable, um, I, I think that's where the importance comes to me. And um, I guess this is where Quest came from as well, Quest Meat. Um, so I was doing this research in bioprocess development for cultivated meat, and obviously I was I was very passionate about it. Um, but in academia, sometimes you tend to get stuck in certain things because of you know because of various reasons, funding, etc. So you're not really making the full impact of the research that you are doing, um, and this is where. Um, I, I started thinking, well, myself and my co-founder, we started thinking about ways to try and uh, make the impact beyond academia. Um, so yeah, that's how Quest uh, was born. 
Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I mean, I think it's really easy to understand why we think this is important. Academic research leading to tech transfer, leading to new products and services. Because you just look at the past decades, every industry from biotech to IT to even financial products, so much of it is based on the work that comes out of university laboratories. And the government through aggressive programs like ARPA and DARPA and NIH programs and others have really helped support this infrastructure that I think this industry sector can now take advantage of, particularly looking at biotech. And there's so many technologies and knowledge bases and experience that a, that a place like Harvard has working in biotech for the past 25 years that can be easily ported over to looking at alternative proteins and food applications. So I think there's a great deal that you can take advantage of from academic research. And to echo what, uh, what David was saying, you know, we see that same problem of what we think are clever technologies, smart ideas, well-patented, well-published, fail in the marketplace. And part of our premise is that they're not ready. They think they are, they're enthusiastic, but they're barely ready to face aggressive investor due diligence, much less the pressures of a competitive marketplace. So we're really working to just make that better. I mean, if we could double the, re the results, get two out of 10 to succeed, the benefits to all of your careers and all of your companies would be immense. So that's why I think we think this is an important topic for today. Okay, so thanks a lot, everyone. So uh, we're going to now switch to a question that relates to portfolio, but to help myself and the rest of the panelists get perspective, how many folks here are currently working at or associated with a university uh, or research institute of some form or fashion? Okay, good. Okay. Now, how, how many are at an early stage startup company or business development type activities? Okay, good, good. Okay, great. So and how many are with uh, with existing public companies? I'll just finish it out that way. Okay, all right. There, you have another friend back there, so that's good. That's good. Okay, so 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 this question of portfolio. When I use the word portfolio, it doesn't mean a a fully vetted product that's ready to go. Because for a lot of the folks here, if it's fully vetted and ready to go, in some cases, uh, it's a different. Um, I guess it's a different business proposition. So when we talk about portfolio here, uh, it relates to your research, maybe that's going in your lab as folks look at it. It could be, you know, a, a company that's just putting together a, an idea stage or a business plan, et cetera. So that's the, the perspective, at least I'm thinking about when we say uh, portfolio in this case. So so this question, uh, I'll direct it to a couple of my colleagues here. And, uh, and then if others want to add, please do. But um, and so I'll start maybe with David. So the question is, uh, what approaches are you using uh, in building your portfolio of, of companies or targets that you look at? And how do you engage with academics and other partners in making that happen? So everything starts with uh, mapping out the pain points, the needs, and the gaps of food tech in the next 5, 10, 15 years. We take those needs and then we go to the academia. We will actively contact uh, different research groups that we think that their research will be applicable to those needs. We'll start conversations. We'll see how we can move that technology towards a tech transfer process. If they want to create IP around that, uh, around the idea that we will provide, that's fine with us. But in the end, it's about having a tech transfer. We will license the, the technology to the Kitchen Hub we will bring in a team, let's say it's a professor or a researcher that wants to continue with his academic career. That is amazing. And we appreciate that. Uh, the person is, the researcher is considered as a founder in the company. We will bring in our own team of a CEO and a CTO that is vetted, of course, by the researcher. And we will fund the company, meaning we don't compromise on any of those stages. The team is amazing, the technology is vetted, and the market fit is there. So zero compromise. It's, it's well-funded for at least two years in our incubation program. Our standard check is around, depending on the shekel and the dollar, but it's around $1.5 million uh, pre-seed investment. And we find that the 
Portfolio companies that we create in this manner, instead of walking entrepreneurs, are much more successful because we really do not compromise. Uh, for example, Aleph Farms, Professor Shulamit Levenberg was spun off by the Kitchen Hub, currently has over 150 employees and valued over $600 million. Yeah, thanks a lot, David. So, Yaduna, you being from a larger organization, could you give some perspective on how your organization looks at working and developing partnerships with the universities and moving forward? Sure. So, uh, it, it's a great question. We have an open innovation group with defined ways of identifying and following technologies and areas of interest that we would look for partnering with. We have shorter term and longer term areas of interest that we look for. But I mean, if I generalize how we engage with universities and academic groups, I would say there's two modes of engagement, clearly. One is a mode where we would look for longer term engagement with groups where we would not necessarily disclose more generally what we want, but rather engage a bit more passively. So there the professor or the group would be pursuing their research so, for example, Professor Marangoni has a great research group. He's doing leading ed edge research. And there may be a lot of other people who might be interested in his research. And we would say, well, this is great. We want a piece of this. So we would essentially partner, sponsor a research. I'm just using that as an example. But we'd say, we want a piece of this. Maybe other people would partner with us and they'd sponsor research. But he obviously wants to publish in Nature. So we don't want to stop him from doing that, right? Because it's important for his group and his students. They also want to become professors at MIT and other places that we don't want to stop that from happening. So what we would do then is there's then that step where his research output would happen. We need to take that research output and there's an internalization step beyond that because there's published very high quality published research that then needs to be adapted and internalized into our program. So that's one part. There's another part, and that could also be Professor Marangoni. I mean, because he's a very uh, 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 wise and brilliant person, could be somebody else who can work as a consultant for us and come in and work with us internally. But that's a compartmentalized approach for specific projects where we would basically work on different projects. And that's more, that, that's smaller more less frequent but those are the two models that we typically use they both work they both have different challenges and they don't all work with every different group okay thank you thank you so uh this question to give you some perspective for it uh and i'd like for alejandro to to address it is that as you look at the work here especially for folks that are in the academic arena it's not the point is not that you're doing great work and you got some other people who want to commercialize your technology. So they'll come in and steal it and go away and make money and leave you hanging. Okay. So sometimes people think that that, that happens uh, sometimes. So this question uh, relates to the, the, uh, the value of um, strong and rigorous science and research. So Alejandro, could you talk to a little bit about why strong and rigorous basic research is really important and the critical aspect of being excellent in science and engineering uh, as, uh, as a discipline? No, thanks. I guess you guys know that I have a, a um, opinion about the fact that you really have to develop a, a strong expertise. Having sat in many university, uh, not university, national committees for granting, the worst thing we get is sometimes food science proposals in which the author has like 10 publications in 10 different areas from tea to like cream. And did you do not know what the person does? You know, so I think that building a fundamental expertise in something is extremely important. Now, I would like to say that I'm very uh, hopeful when I see all the support that academics get from tech transfer offices at Harvard, at, at MIT, at Stanford. Unfortunately, I'm in a small Canadian university in which I think there's two and a half people in our tech transfer office, and they don't know anybody. So when they tell you, they put the pressure on you and say, you go, you know, commercialize this. Well, there is no ingredient coming. Dr. Marangoni, I want a piece of your research. No, no, that does not happen. So I have to go on market. I have to go and talk to people. I don't know what else I have to do. I have to do everything the tech transfer office is supposed to do. So I think if academics have to do, we need better tech transfer offices so that you can do your fundamental work, uh, build your expertise, but at the same time, the pressure of getting to that stage of, of getting your company, your ideas off the ground, can do that. We had a talk with a GFI person and they almost suggested, could there be an external organization 
that would come and maybe have consortiums of universities and offer real tech transfer so that that can be much more effective. I have not seen, maybe somebody can comment on that. And that's what I mean. You have the expertise, people know about you, they come to you. You should keep on building that for your love of science and also because you'll be much more successful. But at the same time, I wish we had much better tech transfer in the not so huge universities that are very well supported. I wonder whether there should be a couple of startups on tech transfer like the kitchen hub but they even bring money which is like unheard of but even if somebody would help you put your technology out in the market it would take a lot of pressure off the academic and allow them to continue their work and also have a benefit for the academic i think it would solve a lot of problems Thanks, Ed. yes thank you thank you uh so this uh, this next question and uh i'm going to direct to to bob if he can speak primarily to it and it's about convergence because in many cases and a lot of your your institutions there could be someone in physics that's doing something that someone in biology might not know or might not think about, or someone in engineering or someone in public health, or believe it or not, someone in sociology, especially as we deal with this particular topic where people are trying to get over, uh, you know, I, I eat beef that comes from a cow, and now you want me to eat this, you're calling it beef, but it's not. There's a, there's a social impact. There's a psychology impact tied to this. Um, so, so Bob, uh, I'm not going to actually talk about psychology, but can you talk a little bit about uh, convergence and how the Vice Institute uh, deals, deals with that, not only with across the Institute, but then across uh, universities in the Boston area, but then worldwide as well? Uh, sure. It's a, it's a big issue, but, you know, fundamentally, 14 years ago, our Institute was founded because we thought the tech transfer process within Harvard was broken. It wasn't working well. And we had an alumni who had been very successful who came back and said, I had trouble licensing technology from my own alma mater into my company. The university people don't speak the same language as we do. We, we just don't communicate well. They don't understand our needs and our pressures. So he said, I'd like to fund this experiment to start within Harvard, an institute that is focused on not just a licensed agreement, but a relationship between parties that leads to a license agreement. So, you know, we've taken this approach. We like to say that we collaborate early and we collaborate often. We collaborate across universities, across teams within universities. Uh, we actively co collaborate with companies, both large and small. And, you know, we, we do that fundamentally, again, to create this relationship. We're we very much believe in small steps in the beginning of a relationship. Identify a small project that you can afford, that the team in the, in the lab can devote time to, and get to understand each other's, the way you work, the field that you're working in, and quite often those can, those can be very successful. And you know we know that fundamentally, uh, large companies for the most part don't have a great appetite for basic or fundamental research. And most universities don't have much of an appetite for selling products. So the whole challenge is how, where do you meet in the middle on to get a relationship that can identify industry problems, which we have to ask. We don't know. We have to get people to describe what are your needs? What have you tried before? And then we can look around internally and say, we might have some approaches or we're going to have to start from a very blank page. But I think that's that's sort of a core of what an academic lab can can bring to either a large or small company. If you can identify specific needs and problems, we'll be very honest because everybody in our university is very busy. They're all got a lot to do. So if we don't see an opportunity to productively do something together, we'll we'll tell you. And I think this idea of communicating openly and early on, to establish relationships that will be productive for both parties is critical. I think what we then identified was we can't expect people to get out of their comfort zone. Academic researchers want to do that for a living. They want to do innovative work. They want to have the freedom to explore areas that don't have clear outcomes, and they want to be recognized through publications and other types of honors. So recognizing that, we put together a support team around our academic labs. We have in-house intellectual property lawyers and experts because you know, in, the, in a marketplace, intellectual property is important. And it's, it's sort of, it's a key to getting value for a university out of, out of things that you invent. Now, in working with people like GFI, we've also had massive discussions around not everything we do has to be subject to a patent. 
and we can do developing country exemptions and humanitarian, humanitarian, human, humanitarian, humanitarian, <laughs> humanitarian exemptions for IP. So it's not like we're, we're grasping every dollar out of every patent, but it, it structures your thinking to file a patent if you've never done it. The due diligence that you have to do to show the innovation and the functionality of a patent application is important. So we also put together a team of engineering types, product developers, to work alongside the research scientists. Because as we all know, you know, biology is very messy and noisy, and engineering seeks to be perfect and well-documented. And that's a tough boundary to cross. So we, we support our academic people with product development people. This is a whole team that they're not academics. They all came from different companies. They're chemical engineers, mechanical engineers, software people, but they know how to work on a schedule. They know what a bill of materials is. And they start to think about all the issues that the academics aren't trained to do. And we can't expect them to do. I often talk to our lab people about, they all understand the technical specification of what they're working on. They know what their goal is. They know when they're 50% there. They know when they're 92% to the end goal. And I talked to them about, there's also a commercial specification that we need to start thinking about. How can we build this? What will it cost? What will it be made from? What's the ease of use? What's the competition? And so I think what I'm saying is our key is to start addressing all of these things early. And our goal in all of this is to separate out the subset of all of the research projects that can be turned into successful commercial products. And it's a small percentage. But if we apply the critical thinking early, we can identify what we think are going to be the winners. We can invest in them. We can help shepherd them along through this whole process. And by involving this greater community in all of these projects, I think we've had a good track record. We've had over 50 startups. They've, they've gotten support by billions of dollars in follow-on investment. And so it's it's the idea that you know one of the mottos at the our at our institute is breakthrough discoveries can't change the world if they don't leave the laboratory and these very smart people with very creative ideas we hate to see them just end up as a publication in a in a prestigious journal and a patent sitting on a shelf somewhere they deserve to be implemented and so again my point is if you have the opportunity reach out start communicating with academic researchers because we'll talk to almost anybody and we'll have an initial conversation and we're really looking for the opportunity to work together so that's how it's it, that's our model it's our process it took some investment it takes some work we have to have a lot of people showing up every day to drive this forward but so far we're very pleased with how this ex experiment of ours is going Okay, thank thank you. So, uh, with that point, uh, underpinning all of all of this, and we've talked about it a little bit uh, before, is the whole question of intellectual property. So, we want to talk a little bit more about that, and uh, and see if we get questions later on in this respect. But uh, I was going to start maybe ask Petra and uh, maybe Alejandro say a little bit about this, and and well, and David. Uh, which so the question is uh, uh, based on your experience, Petra, you as an academic researcher. Uh, about intellectual property and how is why how and why is that important? What's been your experience with it? And maybe David, you can talk about it from your point of view as an incubator, and then uh, and then maybe uh, well, see, I have another question for Alejandro. So maybe uh, yeah, I do if you can you can touch on this question of intellectual property as well from a larger corporation. So, Petra. Um, well, I, I think it's it's actually quite interesting because I've experienced almost I would say two extremes. <laughs> in terms of the institutions that have been affiliated with the academic institutions and how they each dealt with IP and tech transfer. So um, I, I, I've been, uh, my, my current institution, UCL, which is a larger university, a research-focused university, um, actually has a very large tech transfer office as well, which engages with um, academics on a regular basis almost. Um, and they, they are academics. So, I mean, from my perspective as an academic, um, before I started Quest, so a couple of years ago, um, the language that came with it was, was almost, uh, uh, yeah, almost foreign. 
I would say, because I, I don't really quite understand what IP meant or anything like that, or how do you protect it, or the different forms of IP, et cetera. So um, at my previous institution, it was exactly the opposite of what I've experienced at UCL. It was a, a, a smaller university, more teaching focused university. So um, research was more about, yeah, you'll get the funding in, do your research, but then you you know, as long as you get publications out, that's the kind of impact that you will have. Um, a UCL is completely different because with every single proposal for funding that I, I submit for approval to the faculty, um, you have to have a risk assessment associated with it, which looks at the IP, the IP that you will be, the, the background IP that you'll be using, the IP that you will produce, you'll generate, or you think you will generate, how are you going to, um, have you engaged with the tech transfer office, et cetera? So they're a lot more focused on IP and trying to protect it and support um, the academic staff. Um, I, I think it's it's also very interesting what Bob said, quite a few points actually, um, in terms of academics, maybe not always recognizing what IP is or the value of their research. Um, and I think partially that is because of a lack of training um, in, in certain universities. Uh, I mean, as I said, some universities which are more research focused, they're very good at that. They're very good at training their academics to understand all of this language and IP and et cetera. But not, unfortunately not all of the universities are like that. So. Um, yeah, so the, the, this sort of language tends to be quite scary for some academics um, that haven't really experienced the other side. <laughs> um, in terms of the protection of IP, um, I, one thing that, I, I mean, this is a personal um, observation that I've made. With universities, they tend to go more for uh, patents of the technologies um, but I, I mean, I would say it does not, well, and, and uh, patents in the hope of uh, basically going down the route of licensing that technology to um, uh, a company in the long term. Um, but I would say that, may, well, I mean, everyone else can comment on this, but perhaps from a startup point of view, so with my Quest Meet hat on, that's not always the best approach to go to. Um, one, one thing that we've been debating internally is what what's, what's the best strategy to protect your IP? Um, because everything that you do has potential for innovation and it is um, IP. Uh, do you just publish it in the form of a patent where everyone can see what, what you're basically working on or do you keep some sort of trade secret to it? Um, or is it just that know-how that will differentiate you and will help you maintain that protection of your IP? So, um, yeah, I think <laughs> different approaches depending on what you're really trying to do or the institution that you're coming from. To really simplify it, if it's on the shelf, I don't want it. It's like, as Rob said before, if I see patents on the shelf just sitting there for years on end, there's a reason that they're on the shelf. People don't want it. Now, what we really urge researchers to do is to work with us during, while they're, while they're writing their IP, during that ideation process. We have no claims on the IP. We don't take any stakes. We're only liable because we're only giving ideas here. And... And also, exactly what Petra said, really understand, do you really need a patent? Is it better to keep it as know-how? And then, in the future, when the company grows, really write uh, valuable IP on different processes or, or different things in the, in the technology that will be developed. So, I know it's very common for the tech transfer offices to urge to go in the direction of patents and except that's not always your best option i would talk to as many entrepreneurs people in startups people that have a lot of experience and see what is really best for you that's 
you comments on that one and then we'll go. Very excellent points that everybody brought up. I found uh, with uh, all the IP that I have developed that sometimes the patents are actually counterproductive because people can copy you very fast. And if you don't have protection at certain national stage here, <laughs> SOL. But I mean, and then uh, so keeping keeping cards close to the to to your your hand very secret is, is sometimes very good. I also found that working with companies from the very beginning, if one can identify a partner, also focuses the development, and you see the application right away, as opposed to spending a lot of time developing an IP, dreaming up some claims, then you put it out in the market, and then you start looking for people. And sometimes that has been a little bit less successful than finding a partner early on. Now that's a difficult thing to do as well. A partner who's willing to take it to the market with maybe some IP that is not a patent. So, and then what has helped me is to be in the advisory boards of a lot of company, even if you're not developing it yourself and you don't want an to be an entrepreneur, being in the advisory board for the companies, if you're invited to do that can be very helpful to the entrepreneurs and also to be if you want to call it a sounding board, a teacher of the entrepreneur. Sometimes these people do not have time to think about science as well. And a one-to-one -one relationship that could lead to fundamental research projects being funded in your laboratory to help the entrepreneur take it to the market. So it doesn't have to be you taking it to the market, but you can be a facilitator to that. If, and that could be beneficial to your lab. And maybe you get a couple percent or you get a consulting fee out of it. But I think that there's other ways rather than the, the professor taking it to the market as well. I wanna expand on the point that you just made because I think this is very key to the whole topic of this session because it's about from the bench top to the tabletop, right? So ultimately the question is who's actually taking it to the tabletop? So if it's a startup from the university, if it's an industrial partner, it, that's where it comes down to and how quickly you involve those people in the decision-making process, right? As in Greenion, we have an entire patent portfolio and I don't know everybody from the audience, how involved you are in the actual patent prosecution process. It's a very costly process. Every patent that you file, if you actually prosecute it to the end of his life, I mean, it's like, if you do it globally, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? Because to maintain it, now, the only reason we as a company would do that is because there's a product that it's protecting for us that's generating millions of dollars of revenue. And there's an entire strategy behind it. There's review meetings behind it, but it's real money to file and prosecute a patent or a family of patents. Now, when if there's a patent that's already filed that we get as a legacy, for example, from a tech transfer office, if it's a poorly filed patent, it's a done deal. A lot of times you're trying to figure out how to rescue this because it wasn't filed by us and it doesn't relate to the product that we're developing. And then you either file a, what's called a CIP or you have something else to do with this. It's, it's just a mess. So coming back to the point, I think ideally partner early to file the right patent or don't file, but IP collaboration is key to success to bring it to the right tabletop with whoever is bringing it to the tabletop. Otherwise, it's a huge barrier to entry. A lot of times, tech transfer people are greedy for licensing fee and they want to license early, shift it and move on. That's a terrible model. It's a big barrier to collaboration. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So um, this, this next question and is going to relate to uh, career development um, to get just some high level perspective on it because in many cases, uh, if you're an academic institution, you know, moving through the process and getting tenure sometimes is not necessarily counter, but sometimes a lot of institutions are trying to wrestle with, well, how do we factor in a professor or, or, or a researcher who is interested in, you know, commercialization? How do they get credit for that commercialization as part of their career development process? Um, so we're going to just touch on this at a high level because there are many different answers, many different perspectives on this. But so maybe uh, uh, Petra and uh, Alejandro being at the academic institutions, if you could talk a little bit about uh, career development and uh, in addition to academic excellence as a part of a, of a package uh, that folks could be in, find some interest in. Yeah. Um, well, 
I mean, I, I recently, uh, from discussions that I've had with uh, several people around, I recently found out that in the US is quite a different approach or a different view um, in, in regards to academics being involved in um, industry in some sort of capacity, uh, in the sense that the view is that um, their excellence, their academic excellence um, can be affected by that, and that can be a barrier to them basically achieving tenure, etc. cetera. Um, I, I find that very interesting because in the UK and in Europe, the approach is exactly the opposite. Um, by having some sort of uh, interaction with industry, um, even if it's even if you just have a simple placement, a one-year placement as an undergrad in um, a company, and you're experiencing that sort of environment, that is seen as a plus. Also, if um, you are um, a researcher and you you do so, you basically hire. Uh, you, well, you're an employee of a company for a short time, and then you join academia. That again is seen as a plus. So I, I found, yeah, I found that attitude in the US to be quite different to me. Not something that I can really relate. Um, I think the the academic system in the UK um, can. I mean, the, the experience and how um, an early career academic can be more or less independent is very, um, is very dependent on the university as well. So in the sense that if there is a smaller university, the mentality can be a bit more different. Um, so you might not have as many opportunities to progress, but if it is a larger university, a university that is a lot more um, open to equality, diversity, inclusion, and um, also uh, values their ECRs a lot more and their academics a lot more, less teaching, because that also impacts, I, I found it to impact quite a bit, then there's a lot more career development opportunities. Um, and I mean, in, in my case, for example, so I'm, I am a full-time academic at UCL, um, and I, I am only one day um, a week on my uh, company. Um, so the the fact that I'm involved and I have my own company has been seen quite uh, positively and encouraging um, by uh, my fellow peers um, in my department. Um, and it hasn't posed an issue for me in any way. Um, yeah, sure, I had to do a conflict of... Um, a, a management plan for a conflict of interest, um, but that is not, that, that is a, a simple, um, how can I say, solution to marrying the two, um, the two roles together. Um, yeah. Thank you. That's a really difficult one, and I'm, I'm happy to see that some things are happening at UCL. I'd love to hear what happens at Harvard and Stanford in their respect. At our university and in, within the Canadian system, it's seen negatively. Like the fact that you're spending your time developing products and having a company does not count towards your TB until promotion. They want to see publications and other traditional things. Having sat in the review committees for universities like the Technion, like the ETH, like Wageningen, I also saw negative comments regarding the scientific quality of uh, people being promoted to associate professor, even though because of exactly that point then wanting them to devote all their time, maybe professional jealousy, who knows what happens <laughs> behind that. But they wanna see, they come back to the publications and then ridiculous things like what's the impact factor and things like that. Seems to be very focused back. We're back again onto the number of publications at least that well, uh, they're counting again. And then of course linked now to impact factor. So it's double trouble. Uh, but I, I've seen negatively in, in at least in, in our university and also by the granting agencies, my first commercial attempts were in the late 90s, early 2000s, and I know that career-wise, it counted very negatively against me, and I was approached by the dean many times asking me why I'm wasting my time with commercial development. So I think it depends very much on the institution. You have to be very careful until you get tenure and associate status, then you can go crazy, I'm assuming. So, well, Bob, can you maybe I, I hadn't planned to. Can you say a few words about that? Because being at the sort of an intersection between Harvard and MIT and Boston College and all the others, there's a little bit about that. Because there's some people up there that I know and know that you know who who've done quite well. But uh, can you say a few words about this question? 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's always a current question. It has been for decades, right? How are you judged? What matters? And it's, it's so individual, but I've worked with many, many postdocs, for example, over the years who have aspirations to be professors. And they're very nervous about this idea of, you know, tainting their record with corporate involvement or a startup. Now, I have to say that I do see another side of that where it's changing because so many universities now, public and private, are focused on this idea of translating, commercialization. There's accelerators and incubators, and there's the Phil Knight Center in Oregon, and there's the Walton Center at the University of Arkansas. And a lot of these places come to us to, to see what, what's your progress? How have you, have you done this in the past? And so we get constant visitors of people who are setting up this same idea of, well, it's a legitimate goal for a university to try to support the dissemination of all the good work that their, their researchers do. But at the same time, there is still a suspicion, I would say, about people who are too focused on chasing the dollars instead of chasing the papers. Double-edged sword, I guess. Yeah, no, it is, it is. So so thanks. So we, uh, what we're going to do, I think, is uh, I'm going to maybe uh, – Try to maybe wrap up part of this and then leave maybe 15, 20 minutes for, for questions if there are or that number so that we can address some of some of your questions. Um, uh, I think that uh, what we've tried to do here is to give you some different tidbits of components that are important when you're looking at commercializing technology, developing IP, uh, developing your career. Um, while at the same time, you know, maintaining your your stature and most importantly, I think your, your contribution to the the world of, of of science and engineering in general. And sometimes when you have a a problem that seems insurmountable, it's it's just time based, right? Uh, and so a, a quick one here before we you know go into to maybe some of the questions. If you if you look back at say a, a today a disease like diabetes, which is a the horrible disease, has always been a horrible disease, even more so now because it's more prolific, it's multifactorial, affect multiple organ systems, um, you know. And I guess treatment started a long time ago, maybe in the in the twenties. But and uh, and this is from from FDA.gov. Uh, so if you want to look it up, but you know, in uh, in, in the nineteen eighties, early eighties, maybe 80, 80 or eighty one, to make one pound of of insulin took about eight thousand pounds of organs so that's what four tons of organs twenty three thousand animals to treat 750 people imagine that and today you know the worst is i shouldn't say the rest is history in terms of the disease but minimal options to treat the disease but the whole advent of biotechnology, recombinant DNA, you know, Stanley Corn, you know, Boyer, et cetera, Genentech, partnering with Eli Lilly, a company, and, you know, pushed that significantly forward. And then I think Humalog was first introduced, I think, in 1996. But can you imagine that? Can you imagine the cost of that? And so what a lot of you are dealing with in, the, in this space, in this food space, is sort of the same thing, except that it's probably 100 or 1,000 times, you know, more complicated, but it's simply time. Because of the advent, the convergence of technology, advances in science, advances in engineering, people looking at the problem differently, pivot points that happen. And, and when I say pivot point, this is a one final one, then we'll we'll take some questions. Uh, uh, you know, the 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 bottled water business is a multi-billion dollar business. I guess revenue is like maybe $94 billion this year. Can you imagine that for something that you can get free out of the faucet if you filter it right? <laughs> okay. But we pay for that stuff. And that's why I say there's a, there's a psychological aspect to that big time. You know, you can really get it free with a different type of filter to fill out the chemicals. You can add your own minerals, the whole thing, right? I mean, multi-billion dollars. And uh, and this uh, opportunity that that we're working on, that you all are working on, uh, the, the solution will be there. The pivot point will come. I'm not sure what that will be, but it'll, it'll come. And you can see millions of examples around all the time. So it was a very hopeful exercise. And um, so I just want to leave that in terms of, of where we are now with, with this session and, uh, uh, and in terms of maybe some ideas or some thoughts, but also the fact that nothing is really insurmountable, not, not really. Uh, so we want to uh, even, um, well, I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, we'll, we'll stop now and maybe take some questions from the audience on any topics that you want and then go from there. Okay. Yeah. So we have a few that have been submitted through the app. I'll start with one of those and we'll kind of go back and forth between the audience and, and people that have put questions through the app. 
Um, we will pass a mic around so that the people online can hear the question being asked. Um, so the first question from online is, what unique tech transfer programs or tools have you observed or been a part of that have seen success and could be re reproduced at other universities and other research labs? Well, I have to say, <laughs> we've, been, we've been doing exactly that for the last 14 years. We've really honed a process that I think speaks for itself. You can look online. We've got a fabulous website to see, you know, does this process work? What's the outcome? How many jobs have we created? How many patents have we secured? How many companies have started? How much grant material and funding have we, we brought in? So, and I guess if I were to boil it down into one sentence, you just can't expect people to go outside their comfort zone, as I said initially. Don't expect a laboratory researcher, professor, postdoc, other student to do something that they're not trained for in things like IP. And so you have to put support around them. You can't have a passive tech transfer process where a professor wants, wants to file a patent, maybe they'll file it, maybe they'll put it on the shelf, but it, it takes more than that now. The world is too competitive. You have to do a better job of making these technologies investable and actually commercializable. And that takes a whole team as I've discovered. Uh, you want to give him the mic? Oh, okay. Yeah, hi, uh, Chris Baugh, Gus Murray Enterprises. Um, I would like to know what is the best way to reach out to academics for relatively simple requests? So let's say I wanted to get a strain of Camagatella that already has a gene in it that ex expresses a protein, not to commercialize that protein, but to just experiment how uh, we can get that yeast to produce the most protein and then translate that to making nutrients for the greater industry. I can suggest one thing is, you know, obviously I would start with the department that I think is most relevant and just, you just have to sort of knock on doors and make phone calls. I mean, we're a little different because we're very responsive. We have a business development group that looks for opportunities for our technologies and things. So they get paid to be responsive because that may be a simple that may be a simple request, but it may turn into something bigger. And we don't know until we talk to you. Yeah, and just to add to at, at UNC, what we also have there's another process that's called a material transfer agreement. So if you see something that you like, if you if you if there's a tech if there's a professor, because that professor then would also come to the tech transfer office that you know. But if you don't know a professor, if you send a note into the tech transfer office, let them know what you're trying to do. Uh, then there's a there's something called a material transfer agreement that allows for limited use, whatever. It could be cell lines, it could be you know antibodies, could even be in some case animal models. But that's the other that's another part of the process. Yeah. Yeah, hi, uh, thank you so much for the session. It was very insightful. Uh, I actually have two questions. Uh, the, the first one is predominantly around the importance of a PhD to be like a chief scientific uh, officer in a deep tech company. Like how important is it? And the second one is around if, if at all there's a PhD program that focuses more on commercialization of technology over the impact factor of a research paper. And if not, why? Why not? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can answer that. Um, so for, for the first part, um, I don't think there is necessarily a rule. <laughs> to be a CSO and have a PhD. Um, obviously, if you have a PhD, you have lab experience, you have a certain level of expertise, so you, you have more technical skills, you understand better what's going on in the lab. Um, I have met um, executives in, in um, startups that were coming from other uh, backgrounds. So it's, I don't think it's necessarily a rule to come from science necessarily. Ideally, you, you do want for a chief scientific officer, you do want to have that scientific understanding. And I think by having a PhD, you do have more skills that you can apply and you can use. Um, in terms of the second question, um, I think that's a really interesting one. Um, 
I, I mean, I can tell you what UCL has available. Um, I'm not familiar with any of the other um, universities, but um, UCL does um, put quite a lot of emphasis on um, translation, at least in my department. So I come from biochemical engineering. So pretty much all the research that we do is, is very translational because it's, it's all about manufacturing um, biologics. Um, so we do have uh, master level programs that look at uh, commercialization. Um, it is particularly for stem cells, um, for therapeutic cell and gene therapy. We don't have anything in food science just yet, um, but I'm trying to push <laughs> to get uh, something around that. Um, and um, in terms of PhDs, um, I think, <laughs> With PhDs, is a bit more difficult. So UK has um, a lot of um, doctoral training centers, um, which then tend to be focused on certain themes. Um, and they do have elements of, of either translation, commercialization, but I'm not really aware of one program that focuses specifically on that. Um, and, and in a way, I can understand why, because it's, you know, it's a three, four year program, so it's not enough for taking something from an idea uh, to um, a product. Um, so I can, I can understand why nothing like that exists. I don't know if anyone else is aware of anything. Add a comment? So uh, I think if it really depends on the company as well. So any company that is focused on in-depth technology of some kind, and I don't mean like information technology, I mean like uh, things like what people in this room probably focus on, having a, an advanced technical degree, whether it be a master's or a PhD will probably help because you really need to understand the technical depth because the people who will respond to you will likely have a lot of PhDs. So particularly if you're looking at advanced technical services or goods, it'll probably support you. It doesn't mean you have to have it, but sometimes that supports your ambition. So we'll take another question from online. David, this is for you, but anyone who has comments can, can speak to it. Um, one of your comments, David, was about how important it is for companies or um, the Kitchen Hub to stick close to academia from the very beginning. How do you think this approach works best? Is it hiring a recent PhD from the lab? Is it partnering with a professor? And how do you deal with potential different bureaucracies related to IP? So if we're talking about building a new venture, that's what we see ourselves as experts in. I think that's important to to really establish a, a, a streamlined tech transfer process, meaning that we will assist the PhD in developing uh, accurate uh, IP, or if it wants to be kept as know-how, we will engage with the TTO afterwards. We will license the technology. It's important that part of the tech transfer, there is a funded license, a funded research uh, program that we always insist on. We find that it provides a lot of value to the new venture and to the research group, and it provides a streamline of information between the groups. So that can, another way to enable uh, scientific development within the group, just added funding. And of course, bringing in a really, really uh, expert team to lead the venture. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, cool. Sorry. Uh, my name is uh, John. I'm a PhD student at Texas Tech University. Um, so I come from the biomedical space and um, we, you know, recently uh, patented uh, some of my work from a PhD program and we've licensed it out to a company who's developing a therapeutic adjacent to it. But um, uh, I sort of want to move into a space that's more in line with um, solving these sustainability issues. And I think because I'm focused on, you know, not necessarily the profit motive of, of this research, um, and because I have a little bit of experience with this, this IP um, approach, I'm curious if anybody has um, seen anybody in the space who um, has successfully taken 
an idea without IP protections from the startup phase and applied it um, s- successfully because I understand that IP provides a lot of protection, but it would be good to have the collaborative aspect and open sharing um, that you know enables this space in general to develop faster too, which is something I'm interested in. So sorry, generally the question is open. Uh, I would say that in reality, most of the goods and services that we all interacted with don't have patents. They just were good ideas that got to market first, that had quality, that competed well, and they make good businesses. So sometimes if you think the traditional, a VC won't invest in something that doesn't have IP. That's probably true, but not always. So my, my point is, there, there are paths, there are other sources of funding that you can, you can address you know, for unpatented ideas. The other thing is maybe even going back to the patent that you were involved with, you know, there's a lot of field limited licenses. We do that all the time. You can license something for therapeutics, but it's openly available outside that field, or you can get a, a very inexpensive or, or free license for some special field if you approach the licensing office. So you know, try to be creative and, and just look for ways, because if you've got the passion and you've, you've got some knowledge, you'll find a way to make it work. We'll do another online. Sorry, was it you? No. Where? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, another online question. Can someone speak to how the tech transfer process looks different if you're moving from academia to a startup versus academia to a large established company? I'll just say quickly, the risk goes way down if you license to a large established company. (laughs) They've got resources. They've done this before. If they are just going to plug it into their catalog, as a university, your, your, your chances of getting a good return are higher. But we all aspire to that unicorn, the crazy creative thing that's just a blockbuster startup company. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a mixed bag. What you said. I think, so I have an experience which is kind of in between because my team was a startup in a well-established company. So I've kind of done that. And I've been part of more established technology transfer process in a well-established company. So I've experienced that. I haven't done a startup, but I've dealt with startups. I've seen that from the outside as well. I think the process is very, very different because the one thing that a startup has is sort of, they're very scrappy. So they need to do whatever they need to do with limited time, limited resources, to get things done in a very short amount of time. In a well-established company, what you do have is a lot more resources, but at the same time, that comes with a lot more constraints, which force to instill you with a lot of discipline. But at the same point, it gives you a lot more experience, which hopefully helps solve a lot of questions first. So, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example, which hopefully will make this very real for you. So it's uh, something where we we were actually working a long time ago on sponsoring some research where we were working with microfluidic devices with uh, one of the national labs. And at that point in time, I was working with one of the largest paint companies that we were working with. So we were sponsoring this research and this was a grant these guys guys are working on and they discovered a way of making paints, which encapsulated something. It was really cool stuff. And the student that we were working with in the national lab, they're working with a very large university on the East Coast. I won't say which one, but uh, they were making this really nice paint that was encapsulated. And um, it was very cool. They could deliver a lot of stuff that you could put on the wall. Two years of work already gone into it and they wanted to give paint all over the world. So somewhere down the road, me and two other people from our paint company came in and they asked very politely, So how much can you actually make? So they all went into a room in a corner and they came back to us and they said, oh, I think we can probably make like 500 kilos. So we said, but uh, seriously, how much can you actually make? I mean, just go all out and come back. Probably 5,000 kilos. So we said, think about that, right? You're making paint. 
These are not drugs. So think about it. So six months later, they came back with 10,000 kilos work. So, I mean, that was it. I mean, that's all they could make. So, I mean, that project sort of died after a year because they could only make 10,000 kilos of paint. And they haven't thought about that in two years of research. So, uh, most important thing is when working with a large company, uh, I mean, we solve a lot of problems at the same time and we have the resources to solve a lot of problems at the same time. So, in large companies, we solve complex problems and simple problems all together to take it to commercialization. You have to do that because time is very important, money is very important, and resources go together to solve these problems in a time frame. Large teams, very large teams work together. In a startup, they go in critical mode. So they solve one problem, then they go to the next problem, they go to the next problem, which is why rate of failure, they may be the same in both companies, but modes of failure in startup they go differently and startups fail a lot more in different failure modes right in the beginning for that reason. So it's a very interesting question. Would be interesting to do a study as to how projects fail in different companies, but that's my experience. Sort of a long answer by way of story, but it, interesting to study that. In this bench top to tabletop conversation, and you are a bunch of scientists, how does the business or MBA side fit in with that uh, commercialization? Well, it's uh, just to, for perspective, it's really a very uh, interesting one. I think that, you know, well, in a, large, in a larger company, the way it works is that you, you have people either in business development or in marketing that helps to keep the balance with the technical people, particularly in terms of meeting customer needs and also setting goals in many cases, because and in some cases you have technical people to the gentleman's question before who uh, pursue a technical degree and some folks then go back and get an MBA so they can do, do both of those. But typically it's, it's a team sport. And even if you're in a startup, even if you only got two founders or, or a small team, it's, it's always a, a team sport. You may have individuals that's a, that's a founder that is excellent on the technical side, but maybe not on the business side, or and sometimes in rare cases, they can do both too. But there's definitely a, a, a place uh, place for that, for sure. No. Yeah, I think I would just quickly say there was a National Science Foundation uh, grant program a few years ago that you had to demonstrate technical feasibility, patentability, and you had to literally interview 100 potential customers. And it was rigorous and that was hard to do, but I think it speaks to how important they value the business acumen, somebody who's thinking about the market and who the customers are gonna be. Yeah, um, I mean, I can also share from my experience with the startup, because um, as I said, I come from a purely academic background. Um, so everything that had to do with business was, was a bit out of my, well, beyond my understanding um, when I started. I have learned a lot in the past two years. But one of the reasons why um, we chose this particular team as founders for Quest was because we were we all had complementary skills. So I, I would bring the science understanding, um, and then I had partners that came from the business. Um, so actually, having an MBA, I think it prepares you for with some of these skills that you need to run a startup, um, particularly. Um, the understanding of IP, obviously, and in order to commercialize something or take something from an idea to um, a product, you do need funding. So that means that you will have to sit in front of investors and do the work. And it's, it's a completely different skill to just, you know, talking as an academic or doing academic presentations. Uh, you do need to use a different language. So I think by having an MBA, um, you are somewhat prepared for what's about to come if you um, yeah, venture yourself into a startup. Right at time, my goodness. <laughs> Any other burning questions anyone has to add this one to that? So uh, thank you all for coming. Now. And yeah, I just want to thank everyone for their questions. And um, if we can give uh, our moderator and panelists a round of applause.